I'm excited to be a part of a church where faithfulness is the definition of success, not finances, not numbers, um, but being faithful to the calling that God's given us. Good morning, Canoe Creek. Uh, welcome, welcome back. Um, we're excited to be here this morning. You know, we've been in a sermon series we're going to continue into today. It's the last Sunday of it. Uh, we've been playing all in videos every every week of the month. Uh, next month as well, we'll we'll continue to do the same thing. You know, whether uh, this has been next month will be our two year anniversary of kicking off the ministry plan that we titled All In. And uh, for some, many, we learned that they just started coming to church within the last month or over the last year, and they're like, what is this all in? That's why we have this section in the back there to where you can learn about all the vision through the pamphlet. There's a vision card there that will lay it out for you and just like some bullet points and show you how you can get financially engaged to supporting if you want to, if you're able to. Um, as well as in the back, there's information about what's to come, too. We, we launched out with education, wanted to improve that and we're continuing to work on that obviously um, but we also are moving into a renovation phase glad to say we finally have the SDP from the this city we finally have the, uh, the the permits we need from the city our office got put together uh, on Thursday and so the work that's going to have to go into making that ready for our staff but that's kind of like the ball rolling type of event because we have to get out of the space that's over here for that space to be renovated into our new education space as well as our education over here for children's space going to be renovated we should have some cool pictures to be able to show you here soon to give you a vision for it, as well as some numbers of what it's going to take to do it uh, so that we can collectively together find a path to get this done and continue to see the vision here at Canoe Creek grow uh, as we see more and more people from the community making this their church home. We're excited to be a part of it. Uh, the series that we're in, and we end today because today is Palm Sunday, next week is Easter, has been about Jesus' baptism and then it's temptation. But it's it's built on our theme and our, our purpose for the whole year is to know the gospel better and practice gospel culture in our life. Now, all the sermons within a series like this and within a year like this, they all stand alone. Anywhere God's word is preached, the spirit can work in such a way in the lives of those who are being transformed and changed and shaped and grown. Uh, but I do believe that the very first two sermons of the year were a great foundation for this. I'm almost gonna, tempted to ask Sean, say, hey, we need to reboot those halfway through the year and preach them again. But you can always go back and listen to them in our sermon archives on the website or on the app. Because basically at the end of the day, what they were asking us is, do we have a pure gospel at the center of our heart driving us? Or do we have a partial gospel? Uh, something that we've partially trusted in, partially believe in, or it's partially filtered with some of the things that we want and some of the things that we desire. And this is such an important question to ask of ourselves as we grow, because at the end of the day, you know, Jesus himself says to people, there's going to be people who say to me, hey, didn't we do this in your name and that in your name and all these things in your name? And what does Jesus say? I never knew you. And, and, and that can be used like as a fear tactic. It's not my desire for it to be a fear tactic because fear only motivates us for a minute. Love transforms us for a lifetime. And, but the reality of it is, is as Christians, if we want to say we're Lord, our Lord and Savior is Jesus, we follow him, we should be constantly and consistently questioning how we grow or how we are growing in him. And, and that's what we're looking at uh, today in many ways. A thought that kind of introduces us into the content we're going to look at that immediately struck me. It's kind of an old story for me that's a very embarrassing one. There's actually a picture that goes along with it. We will not be using that picture because I can only be embarrassed to such a degree. But it was homecoming for me in middle school in sixth grade, okay? Okay. And I asked Allison, this girl, to go with me, and she said yes. So I was like stoked. It's awesome. I got a date. You know, I'm not a total loser. And, and then I rented a tux. Well, I was the only dude in a tux, okay? Now, this isn't too much of a stretch back in the day, but it was a white tux with pink trimmings. I mean, it was hot, you know what I'm saying? 
That's not exactly how, I mean, I look like dumb and dumber rolling in there, to be honest with you, but, um, but it was the thing, man, it was the thing, but that's not even the worst part of it, all right? We're at the dance, I mean, I, I like had to sign up for homeschool after this scenario, so I had not been feeling well, but I didn't think anything of it, I was like, oh, I just pass. At the dance, I start puking everywhere. I'm that guy. Listen, I prayed to the Lord that everybody would know my name. They did. It's great, you know. Monday was awesome. You know what I mean? You know, everybody knew me. I was like the most popular kid in middle school. Okay. Um, not the best homecoming. Sometimes we don't have great homecomings, right? You know, I remember when my wife and I moved down here, we'd go back to North Florida on a regular occasion. But when we would go up for like the first four years, it always felt like this is home. This is where I'm supposed to be. I remember that one trip finally where we went up there and I was like, this doesn't feel right, you know, and this was now home. Um, maybe you've experienced homecomings in a different way, not like a dance, but an actual homecoming, right? Or you went away for a season of time and, and maybe in that season of time you grew in a good way, you changed. Now, all living things grow. Doesn't mean they grow well. Some of them can grow like weeds. Others can grow like flowers, okay? Um, and when you return home, it was like a time capsule. You know, every place you used to eat looked the exact same. It still had the same grease on the ceilings, you know? All the people were the exact same, you know? And, and while your life had moved forward, you realize that your home had not moved forward. You know, in some ways, there's a great illustration in this with the prodigal son as well, because sometimes when we move about and we change something, we can be radically changed, and we can come home and experience that things are still the same. If you know this story, if you remember this story, this is a really arrogant, obstinate son who basically tells his father, I want my inheritance now. I'm not willing to wait for you to die. I mean, that's how much of a jerk he was. Father was gracious, gave it to him, and he left. And the story is that the harshness of life rubbed him raw. It worked off the rough edges to the point that this son returns home humbled sincerely, so much so that he's not willing to ask to be the father's son anymore. He said, I would just like to be your servant. He was changed. But what's interesting, and that's where the stories normally focus, even a greater focus in that story, in my opinion, is the older brother, who is the exact same hard heart that he had and never left. And, and what's interesting about the story is, you know, when it ends, the guy who's the jerk or at least was, he's the only one apparently who has a good relationship with the father. It's the other one who appeared great in every way that you're not sure what kind of a relationship, if any, they still have with the father. So, you know, homecomings are interesting things. And let me just kind of introduce you to a couple of ideas. Maybe your view of Jesus and the gospel, you have a very grace oriented view. Great. But it's to the point that you can pretty much justify in your life whatever it is that you feel like you need to justify because after all, God is caring, God is loving, God is gracious. And so the idea of growth, change, moving forward one season to the next, one year to the next, one day to the next, you're never too young to grow, you're never too old to grow. That just is something that goes untouched for you. Yeah, because after all, God is gracious, all is good. Maybe your view is the opposite, the polarized of this. It's a harsh one. You're focused on what you got to do, what you must do, what you need to do, what God wants you to do so you could be pleasing to him. And as a result, you're always careful to try and dot every I, every T is crossed in your life. And you have very little grace for yourself or other people around you, which is why you don't have many friends, Right? And that is a standard that nobody can keep, and it's exhausting for everyone. Let me just ask this. Is it possible that you've allowed a half gospel, a partial truth, to be set up in your heart as what it is that you're trusting, what it is that you're following? 
what it is you desire. And, and this sermon series has been designed all the way around. This whole year's designed for us to peel back some of the layers and ask myself the question, what do I really believe? And what should I really be practicing? And how am I tra- changing and transforming throughout this year as well? Now, you know, ultimately, when we talk about the idea of homecomings, they're not always the easiest or the best. And this is what we see happening with Jesus. We're going to be in Luke chapter 4 to begin with two verses mainly today. Uh, You can use your Bibles, Bibles on the racks in front of you. You, If you use the Bible app, that's not our church app and how we communicate information about our events. It is the Bible app and we load our sermon content on the slide behind me as a process for how you can see that sermon content in case you want to follow up with it later. Luke uh, chapter 4 is our main verse, and then we're going to be have, we'll have one main verse that ties us to the, the Palm Sunday recognition as well today. Uh, but beginning in verse 14, we're going to hit a few of these. I can't read it all because it would be very long and drawn out. Beginning in verse 14, this is what we read. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of of the Spirit. Remember, the Spirit alighted on him. John noticed this. The Spirit sent him into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted, and now he is returning into the ministry world for what he is called to do in what? The power of God's Spirit. And news about him had spread through the whole countryside. So he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And there is where he read in the synagogue Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the, for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So we have Jesus going back to his hometown where everybody knows him, right? And he's going back in the power of the Spirit. And these people have heard about all these amazing things that he's done. They're excited to maybe see those things done there. These people have all kinds of ideas of who Jesus is because they've known him their whole life, right? Some of them watched him as a baby. Some of them cared for him as a little child. Some of them taught him as an older child. Some of them had furniture made by this guy, and he's coming back. And so the ways of how they viewed and thought about Jesus was probably hard for them to overcome because they have expectations, they have preconceived notions, they have ideas of who he is. And yet they're hearing these amazing things. They're like, he never did that in the first 30 years of his life here. When did all this take place? What's going on? What's happened? And so they've heard all these amazing things. And so a visiting rabbi would be invited in the synagogue to read scriptures like he did. And he was given the scroll of Isaiah. And he finds a 700-year-old prophetic word about the anointed one of God, the Messiah, the one God chose to free his people. And he reads that. So that's pretty exciting. He knows what he's about to do. Look at what he does. He began by saying to them, verse 21, Today, this scripture that I just read for you, this is a 700-year-old prophecy about this special person that God's going to send, is fulfilled in your hearing. How do they respond? All spoke well of him. They're amazed at what? His gracious words that came from his lips. But at the same time, some of them are like, wait a minute, this dude built a chair for us. I'm a little confused. Isn't this Joseph's son? Didn't we watch this guy grow up here? He's never done anything amazing. He's never been anything amazing. He's just been Joseph's son, the carpenter. I mean, he's been a nice guy, nice kid. He was trustworthy. He could do all of his work great and yada, yada, yada. But man, how am I supposed to see this guy as somebody who's doing miracles over here? He's the anointed one of God. He returns with all these amazing things. And so here's what it's like. There's some people who find out in my life, like Ross Runnels, he's a preacher? (laughs) That's a lie. There's a lot of people who know me BC. You know what BC stands for, right? That's before Christ. And if they hear that, they're like, they they have ideas in their head. They have images in their head. 
It's not just me puking on a tux, okay? Um, and they're like, yeah, no, why? Because those types of images, those types of ideas, they're very hard sometimes for us to overcome. I wonder how many of us have that regarding Jesus. And it makes it difficult for us to grow. Now, while people are pleased by what they're seeing and hearing here, the text even says that they spoke well of him, they're amazed. But in order for their lives to be changed, they have to see him as Isaiah spoke of him. And to be honest with you, Jesus isn't going to do anything amazing because he knows in that moment, it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what I do. They have so much junk in their vision of who I am that it's not going to clear it out of the way. So look at what Jesus goes on to say. It's almost as if he agitates them intentionally. But Jesus said to them, surely you'll quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself, and you'll tell me, do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. But truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years. There was a severe famine among everybody, including the Jews. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of the Jews. He was sent to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And, you know, there's a lot of people in Israel, Jewish people, who had leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet none of them were cleansed. Only name in the Syrian. This is what Jesus says to him. And here's what Jesus does. He basically says, I'm not going to do anything special here because it's not going to change what's going on or how you see me. Because at the end of the day, what it results in for them is a sense of chaos. Because I don't know if you were reading the same text I was reading. It just said they were, they were excited. He had gracious words. They were glad to receive him. Everything is great. And then Jesus says this. And essentially he says, listen, there was all kinds of Jewish people who needed God, and God didn't show up for them, but he showed up for two non-Jewish people. There's so much packed in this. Look at what happens, verse 28 through 29. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. This is a quick flip, man. They got up, drove him out of the town, took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff so he'd be dead. <laughs> but he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Even though Jesus had returned in the power of the Holy Spirit, even for Jesus there's something different about him. Even though he returned with a testimony of John the Baptist himself said, the Spirit alighted on this guy. Even though he returned after having battled with the devil for 40 days in the wilderness and was perfectly obedient in every way to his hometown, the people try to kill him. And they miss who he is and what's going on because they have so many preconceived ideas in their vision that they can't get past. Here's the question. How have... Or are your preconceived ideas or traditions limiting you from growing in Christ? You know, one of the things I'll say here often is you can be convicted in rows, but you will only grow in circles. And I know, I mean, I can remember when I wasn't preaching. You know, it's been a minute, but I can remember when I would just show up to church and, you know, maybe I was serving somewhere or whatever it is. Maybe I was engaged or not, whatever. But, but sitting down and listening to a message and thinking, man, how does the preacher know what it's like in my house? <laughs> I have people say that to me and I just laugh. I'm like, I didn't have you in mind at all, but thank you for just, you know, spilling your guts to me and telling me everything. By the way, I'm, I don't do confessionals, but whatever, you know. Um, and being convicted deeply over something and that lasting all the way until Wednesday. I mean, it was painful, <laughs> you know, before it wore off. Because we can be convicted by things, but real change and transformation comes when we're engaged face-to-face -face with people who don't call us out, but they call us up in love. 
and encourage and strengthen us in all kinds of ways. And, you know, how is it that you are growing in such a way to where you're engaging in more than just your same old tradition or your same old routine? And here's the deal. Okay, listen, if you just started coming like last week or the week before or even a few months back and you're like, hey, you know, maybe this is your first time. I don't know. Maybe it's your first time back in a long time saying I got to get re-engaged and I got to start growing from here. That's awesome. That's great. All right, and maybe remember that you're in a place where the only two eternal things are gathered together, God's word and God's people, amen? And being a part of that consistently is important and it's good. But now that the question is, but maybe that was, that's been your pattern last year, the year before, the year before. And my question to you is, how is your vision of Jesus and his plan for your life more abundant today as a result of your engagement with God's church? And if it's not, why? And what can you do to ultimately change that and to have a more abundant view of God? And consider the Apostle Paul. It took an act of God to convince the disciples that he had changed. You know, imagine every, everyone had a view of him and their mind was stuck on it because this was the guy who was killing Christians. He essentially had a license from the Jewish leadership to go round up Christians, put them in prison, and do terrible things to them. And the disciples had this image of Paul seared into their minds and it took a supernatural movement of God to say to Ananias, no, it's okay, go do this, go talk to him, you're good, it's going to be all right. I mean, I get it, some of them might have been saying, well, maybe it's a trap, maybe it's a trick, we better not do that, but I guarantee you, many of them thought like we did, there's no way a guy like Paul could ever change. And when we think that of people in our lives around us, what we're doing is we're limiting Jesus to the little baby Jesus that I knew in Nazareth. Or just the guy who built my table in Nazareth versus the amazing power that we see of him. And how much junk do you have in your vision, in your way from seeing clearly, believing boldly, you know, accepting fully, whatever next steps God has for you in this season of life. I don't care if you're young or old. As long as you're breathing, God's not done with you yet. My, my good buddy Alan Algren will say that to me all the time. Are you, as a result of your preconceived ideas and you're kind of locked in your ways on some things because, you know, your grandma used to tell you about this biblical tradition from Second Hesitations 3, 5, and you just got to hold on to that one or whatever it is that may not be biblical at all, but it's what you want to think, it's what you want to see, it's how you want to view them. How are you missing fresh movements of God in your life? Because it's easier for you, it's better for you to take little baby Jesus or carpenter Jesus or town Jesus or friend Jesus and just put them in your pocket and carry them around with you because you're a Christian and all. And then whenever you need to, you just whip them out. Maybe you got a problem, got to whip them out. Hey, take care of this Jesus, whatever it is, right? Versus letting him be Lord. Because Savior's easy. But Lord is very difficult. And so the entire town of Nazareth had the Son of God in their town. He was, it was his town too, ultimately. And they're excited by his gracious words, but they cannot get past the preconceived image of Jesus. And they flipped and they flipped fast. From, oh, he's great. Hey, let's kill him. And isn't the only time people flipped on Jesus. Turn with me, Matthew 21. Let me read this for you because it's, it's an investment of time, and I just want to read the Word of God, let the Holy Spirit does what he does. It's a recognition of Jesus entering into Jerusalem, which is six days before his death. We recognize this as Palm Sunday. Matthew 21, beginning in verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpeg on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with, with colt, uh, her colt by her. Untie them, bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that they, the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. And this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Uh, say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle, riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so the disciples, they went, they did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road. 
while others spread branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Uh, The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna is in the highest heaven. And so when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowd answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And so they're shouting Hosanna, and just in six short days, the crowd was crying something differently. Pilate said, what should I do then Uh, with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? They all answered, crucify him. Why? Why? What crimes has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the longer, crucify him. They don't want truth. They don't want details. They don't want to influence how they see God, his son, or how their lives should be conformed to his will. They just simply want what they want. And as a result, they say this is what needs to be done. And so, you know, at the end of the day, the people expected a military leader. They got a merciful one. Very different than what they expected. They expected a political motivator, and they got a peaceful leader. They expected a leader to crush the Romans. And yet they got a man who has the capacity and the power uh, from one side of the ocean to the other side of the ocean to change, to conform the hearts of anyone, regardless of language, regardless of culture, regardless of anything that can stand in the way ultimately of such a thing. And so, you know, at the end of the day, uh, Jesus didn't once march on or visit the fortress of Adonai or Herod's palace. He didn't have political movements with signs and so on and so forth. They expected a king of physical power. They got a king of spiritual power. A prophet to praise uh, their religious efforts is what they wanted, and they got one that ridiculed their rigid hearts. They wanted immediate change, and Jesus told them, There will be a kingdom that is growing like a seed, slow and steady, constantly changing and developing into what the God of heaven desires. And so they missed the Son of Man. They missed the anointed one of God. They missed the explanation and the presence of the Father that stood right before them. And we could go on with more and more titles. But here's what I want to encourage you to do. More important, ask yourself, how have you formed the gospel to your image? How have you made Jesus who you want him to be? Whether it's bad information from previous experiences of life and years before, or it's just simply what you were brought up to know and you just have stuck with that, rather than actually be like others in the scriptures that search it to know what it actually says for yourselves. Um, At the end of the day, how are you missing Jesus because of your expectations of him that don't line up with your vision of who he is? How are you not growing? How are you not serving? How are you not supporting the mission of God because you become comfortable with back pocket Jesus that you can whip out whenever you want him to be whipped out, ultimately to keep your view of him as you want. Uh, Years ago in the 90s, there was this movie. It starred John Travolta, and uh, it was called Broken Arrow. And I would not recommend spending an ounce of time on this movie. Um, I watched it years and years ago. It's not worth it. But here's why I bring it up. It shocked me in one way. Because if you know John Travolta, he's Mr. Saturday Night Fever, whatever that was. And then he, uh, tons of comedies. And I think right before this in the 90s, he was really well known for this comedy with little babies. You know, and that's how I view him, right? That's how I see him. He's either dancing or he's playing with little babies. And all of a sudden they have this movie. And I don't know what it's really about, except for, it's, you know, it's about somebody trying to steal a nuclear warhead. It was a new plot. You know, they never do movies about that. And... Um, 
And all of a sudden, he's this like pilot and a stealth bomber and his, his partner next to him, I guess, starts sensing something's going on. And, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, John Travolta whips out his gun. He goes to shoot his partner and his partner ejects. And I'm like, oh, no. I didn't expect it because he's a dancing fun guy. He's not the, I'm the bad guy about to kill somebody, for, you know, for my own personal gain reasons. And it, it caught me off guard. Are you willing to let Jesus catch you off guard? Are you willing to let Jesus shock you into what he's capable of, not just in someone else's life, but in your life? Are you willing to grow more, change more? Or is it just the idea, I'm too young, I'm too old, I'm too in the middle, therefore I'm really busy, or whatever it may be? And that's a big question that we need to ask ourselves. It's, you know, is it just not what you expect? Whereas Jesus is calling something bigger of you. Let me, a couple questions. What are you doing to know Jesus better? That's on you. That's not on me. Don't tell me we need some underwater basket waving ministry here and that will help your life grow more. I mean, come on, you know, Canoe Creek is doing all that we can. We're doing more. That's what the All In Vision's all about. But the All In Vision only works as if everybody's all in. The whole point of the name, right? That's how we grow. That's how we move. What are you doing to know the gospel better? Is your grandma's gospel that you were fed when you were younger and you've come to believe now, is it true or is it tradition? Is your mission about what you want or what God wants? You know what I could really use, Ross, is a couple more jokes in the sermon. It'd make my life better. And then the next person says, you know what we could use, Ross, is just a few less jokes in the sermon, okay? And just stick to the word of God. We really need this song on this Sunday. And sometimes what we make the gospel to be in our lives is whatever that nostalgic moment was for us in the 19 whatevers, and when it was my heyday and I became a Christian and I just want to lock it in versus the fact that, you know, the methods of how we share the gospel always change even though the message always remains the same. Is your greatest desire, speak, Lord, and I'll be your servant and I'll be open to hear what your word's saying to be able to grow from there. You know, this has been the primary focus of our first quarter. It's going to be the primary focus of the next four or the next three quarters. I'm going to make this year five quarters. All right, next three quarters as well. But listen to this quote from Scott McKnight, uh, the King Jesus Gospel. When we are fully connected with God in this eternal union with God through his son, humans will be doing exactly what God intended for his creation. You get that? When we're connected in that union, we're doing what is good for God, which in the end is good for us and his creation. God will be God, and we will be God's people. And the whole story will be about you. No, God, which is what God would desire. But the problem that we struggle with uh, is stated best by N.T. Wright. He said, many Christians today, when reading the New Testament, never question what the word gospel means. But assume that since they know from their own context what they mean by the gospel, Paul and others must have meant exactly the same thing. So we contextualize the gospel to whatever I think it is. It's a very narcissistic view, but it's true. And so the gospel becomes so many things to so many people in a culture that is very relativistic. It's about how I see it, how I want it. And so putting that in clear speech, when we establish our own expectations about Jesus, we will keep working on our own story and missing the opportunity to really be brought into a dynamic and eternal and powerful story no matter where we're at. Every season, the word of God's gonna become refreshed and new to us in that season because God knows exactly what my 20-year-old, my 30-year-old, my 40-year-old, my 50-year-old, my 60-year-old, my 70-year-old, my 80-year-old self needs to see in God's word to be faithful and continue to have an expanding, bolder view of Jesus in my life and for the world around me in that moment. And if you don't believe that, then you don't have the gospel. You've got parts of it and pieces of it. 
God always wants more for us than we want for ourselves. And so let me just encourage you, study the scriptures consistently in a fresh new way. Do it in community. We grow in circles. Stop trying to get what you want and start seeking what God wants for you. Stop trying to get what you want from God and start seeking what God wants for you. Serve God's plan, his church, with no desire of reward. Now, see, sometimes we, want it, we, we do it just because we want a that, uh, a that a boy, a pat on the back, whatever it may be. Uh, except, this is a hard one, except that you most likely have junk in your vision. That you have expectations that are hindering you and holding you. And in each year, each season of life, God's gonna strip those away and allow your vision to expand more and more. This way you can identify whatever they may be and begin to work on clearing them out of your vision. At the end of the day, when we think about this, it's so important for us to recognize that we probably have preconceived ideas or traditions that are limiting our vision of what God can do in our life, through our life, and around us to other people. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity uh, to study this homecoming of Jesus as he returns in the power of the Spirit, uh, knowing that um, you are amazing in what you have the capacity to do, and if we let you, you'll do it. Teach us every day, Lord what it means to go beyond just allowing you to be our savior because that makes us happy and allow you to be our Lord where you'll bring us into challenging seasons, challenging situations, and you'll grow and move in our hearts through them in such a way, Lord, that um, we can find ourselves radically different people on the other side, uh, people in union with you who ultimately as a result have become a new person in many ways. And Father, we pray that as a result, uh, you would work in the lives of others around us. You would bless people through us. And that our reward in that is to know that more can see a cleaner, more pure image of your son Christ, to know a cleaner gospel and, and, and practice it in their own lives. And so Father, we pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Every Sunday at Canoe Creek, we, we have a time of communion together. Uh, there's the elements on the back table, uh, the, the bread and the juice that remind us of the body and blood of Jesus. If you're a believer in Christ, this is for you. If you're not a believer in Christ, and obviously you probably don't understand this, this time of the service, please keep in mind that there's nothing mystical, metaphysical about these elements, that if I take them, I'm going to somehow be changed, transformed, or better. This is a practice of following the commands of Christ. And he told us, do this in remembrance of me. So as believers in Christ, we are doing what Jesus has called us to, to remember his sacrifice, to remember his commitment, and then question ourselves regarding ours. Not in a sense of shame, that has to do with who you are as a person, but in a sense of trusting that God will always bring us through the difficult seasons of our life, even when we usher them in through sinful activity, and he'll use guilt to bring us to repentance, to grow through that moment, God will waste nothing in our lives. And so we recognize what it took to make us whole, to make us pure, to make us new, and we recognize the love that went into it. And we celebrate that every Sunday because on the following of his death is his resurrection. And if that's possible, then the pauls of our life and even our own hearts can be reshaped and our visions can be renewed. Let's take this in remembrance of the sacrifice of Jesus.